when you think about uh, Bill Clinton's aversion to the truth, you wonder uh, if this is because of the lackadaisical moral background that he's had in this area. Uh, he lied about Rhodes being a Rhodes Scholar. He never completed that and still said he was a Rhodes Scholar. He went to Moscow and did business with them uh, against the United States government and he wasn't challenged by the press about that. In Arkansas, while he was governor, he said he balanced the budget 11 times. He never did it once. Also, he said he didn't raise taxes, and he raised taxes 126 times. He can accommodate any situation that comes up because he's not hemmed in with the truth. I've never felt that Clinton, consciously or unconsciously, was hemmed in with morality. I first met Bill Clinton in the mid to late 70s. He was an up-and-coming politician. Uh, there were a group of us, Jim Guy Tucker, uh, Bill Clinton, Sheffield Nelson, and myself, and we kind of ran around and palled around with each other. It was from that point that I did a lot of projects for Bill from a marketing perspective. In 1988, I went to Bill and I said, I need uh, a job to kind of relax, mellow out. Bill Clinton and Betsy Wright, they suggested that I go to work for a place called the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. And they said my talents could really be used there. It was uh, the best kept secret in Arkansas. After about two weeks, I went to Wooten Epps, and I said, Wooten, I think I've got enough background on this that we can start marketing it. Now, what is the criteria for loans? He said, whoever Bill wants to get a loan. To go back, though, to that moment in time, I'd been there about a month, and I realized that I was in the epicenter of what I'd always heard about all my life. What most people have heard about is the machine. I was literally working, sitting in the middle of Bill Clinton's political machine. It was where he made payoffs, uh, where he repaid favors to people for campaign support. Uh, I was in an interesting seat, and I knew it. Bill Clinton sold the concept of ADFA to the people of Arkansas as a vehicle for creating jobs and assisting churches and schools. In reality, millions of taxpayer-guaranteed dollars were being channeled to Clinton's election campaigns, to his inner circle of friends, and to his wife Hillary's law firm. This may explain why ADFA had been drafted in such a manner as to keep its decision-making procedures secret. If you needed a million dollars, you had to get your application handled by the Rose Law Firm, pay them $50,000. There were five other companies in the state of Arkansas that were actually more qualified in bond structuring and applications, but Rose Law Firm got them all. I started checking around and I kept asking, well, you know, one thing's bothering me to the comptroller, Bill Wilson, you know, how do people make payments on these loans? He looked at me and said, they don't. He thought I knew. Well, that blew my mind. And this is about two months in and it was getting tough then. So I started gathering the documents. After everybody left, I would stick around as if I were working on the annual report that would give me access to all the documents. And I made copies of them all. For about two months, I watched accounts accumulate money. At the end of the month, they zero balanced. They're laundering drug money. There were a hundred million a month in cocaine coming in and out of Mean, Arkansas. They had a problem. They were doing so much money in cocaine, a hundred million. You, you create a problem in a little state like Arkansas. How do you clean one hundred million dollars a month? ADFA until 1989 never banked in Arkansas. What they would do is they would ship the money down to Florida, a bank in Florida, which later would be connected to BCCI. They would ship money to a bank in Atlanta, Georgia, which by the way was later connected to BCCI. They'd ship to Citicorp in New York, which would send the money overseas. And there was an interesting one, a bank in Chicago. That bank, by the way, is partially owned by Dan Rostenkowski. Dan Lassiter would get the bonds. He would become the broker for the bonds. He would transfer money back to ADFA. He never sold a bond. The money then would leave ADFA, go into one of the various banks for the specific bond loan, and they would zero it out. When they zeroed it out, they were giving it back to Lassiter, unless they're handling fees. Dan Lassiter, who was the best friend of Bill Clinton, who went to jail with Roger Clinton, cocaine. And by the way, let me explain something. He didn't sell cocaine. Now, 
They were giving it away. Huge piles of cocaine in his office. Ashtray upon ashtray full at the parties, and they would give it to young girls. That's sick. I mean, they were giving a highly addictive drug to young girls. Dan Laster contracted to launder the money. Now, in addition to his contract to launder the money and the system that he and Bill Clinton had set up to do it, probably what he did is he took advantage of some of the cocaine. That's why he could give it away. Should you have $100 million a month in cocaine? They wouldn't care if you took a bucket full a day. Once he was convicted, he went to a minimum security prison, a holiday hotel, we call them. He spent, I think it was six to eight months, and he got out. Unbeknownst to anybody, Bill Clinton, the day after he got out, granted him a full and complete pardon. So if you think he's tough on crime, think about a man that pardons a man that gives cocaine to kids. Fear of violence is robbing our children of their future. We must take away that fear and give them hope. We must give Alicia and all our children back their childhood. Working together, we can. Your president, the president of the United States, not only was a part of a system that was laundering millions of cocaine dollars, your president signed off on it. He can't deny that he did. You see, because of that, there's one little catch. Every loan that ADPA made, Bill Clinton himself had to sign off on it. More than Bill Clinton, you better identify the people in the loop of the drug running. You better identify the people in the loop for money laundering. And what you'll find there is those people go straight to Washington. This is a circle of power. These are the people, when he got elected president, he did not pass go. He took them straight to Washington with him. Yeah, Bill Clinton was hooked on cocaine. I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay, and uh, I worked at a cup called the, Bist the Bistros, and I met Roger Clinton there, uh, Governor Bill Clinton. Roger Clinton uh, had came up to me, and he had asked me, could I get him some coke, you know, and ask for my one-hitter. And uh, I watched um, Roger hand what I had gave, given him to um, Governor Clinton, and he just kind of turned around and walked off and that's one specific. Dr. Suen, uh, S-U-E-N, the uh, doctor at the medical center here in Little Rock has taken care of Bill Clinton for his sinus problems which may indeed be drug related to cocaine use um, as they destroy the sinus passages. Governor Bill Clinton was taken into the hospital, I believe it was the medical center, on at least one or two occasions for cocaine uh, abuse and overdosage in which he actually had to be cared for at the hospital. Clinton had integrated a number of corrupt cops, judges, and politicians into high-level positions to ensure the continued success of the drug smuggling, money laundering operations. All was going well until a fateful night in the fall of 1987. On August 22, 1987, Kevin had spent the night with his friend Don Henry. They left uh, Don's home around 12.30 or quarter to one uh, on the 23rd of August in early morning hours, and uh, the next thing we knew, they had been run over by a train. There seems to be a small airstrip in the area. There have been sightings and uh, reports of small airplanes flying very low with lights off in the area. I believe they saw something they shouldn't have seen. Three weeks later, their deaths were ruled accidental by the state medical examiner Fami Malik, and um, we disagreed with that ruling uh, because we thought the evidence pointed to homicide. Ultimately, it was proven that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' skull had been crushed prior to the placement of their bodies on the railroad tracks. However, Malik stood by his ruling that the boys had simply fallen asleep on the tracks. Malik had been kept in office at the insistence of Governor Clinton for a number of years, despite vigorous public outcry to have him removed. As long as Malik's rulings pleased the governor's office or state police, they were left to stand, no matter how implausible. Malik's obvious lack of medical knowledge reached a pinnacle when he ruled that James Milam, who had been decapitated, had died of natural causes. Yet Clinton, who had the power to remove Malik from office, insisted he stay. 
A number of people approached the police with information about Don and Kevin's murders and consequently were murdered themselves. Shortly before Keith McCaskill was murdered, he, he knew that he was fixing to be murdered. He told his family goodbye, told his friends goodbye. Uh, the night of um, elections in 1988, uh, he took two pennies out of his pocket and threw them on the bar there at the wagon wheel and said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And he was murdered that night. Uh, Jeff Rhodes was a young man from Benton who uh, uh, was murdered in 1989. Um, shortly before his death, he made a phone call to his dad in Texas and told him he needed to get out of Benton, Arkansas, that uh, he felt he knew too much about the boys on the railroad tracks and uh, the death of Keith McCaskill. Uh, a couple of weeks later, Jeff was found dead. Uh, he'd been shot in the head. Uh, they'd attempted to cut off his head and hands and feet, set him on fire in a dump. A total of six people with information about the boys' murders were eventually murdered as well. Not one major cocaine bust was ever made in Arkansas, out of Mena, Arkansas. Now imagine that, 10 years nearly in its running. Never one truckload ever got caught. A lot of people have said that the Mena operation stopped in 1986 when Barry Seal was gunned down. It's not true. Covert operations are still going on in Mena, Arkansas today. Now, if you stop and think, back when Bill Clinton was governor, he was asked about Mena. He said, well, well that's a federal problem. I'm, I'm not going to get involved in it. Well, he's not the governor of Arkansas anymore. He's the president of the United States. We still have operations at Mena, Arkansas. This is his golden opportunity to take care of it. My question is, why doesn't he? President Clinton's verbal commitment to a war on drugs has been negated by his actions. During his first weeks in office, Clinton revoked random drug testing for White House staff members. He eliminated 121 positions at the Office of National Drug Control. And he appointed Jocelyn Elders as U.S. Surgeon General, despite her well-known desire to legalize drugs. So you see, all of this incest, and all of this drug running, all of the trafficking of drugs, sending them all over the nation, came out of Little Mina, Arkansas, right under the nose of little Governor Billy Clinton. I went to Bill, and I said, Bill, you've got two weeks to tell the truth, or I'm going to tell it. You're breaking the law, and I can't be a part of it. You made a mistake. I'm not one of your buds. At least I'm not that big a buds. It's not hard. You see, after 12 years, after kissing the people that have the money, Bill Clinton controlled the legal system. He controlled the judges. He controlled the attorneys. He controlled the banks. One thing that's very difficult for people to understand, Bill Clinton doesn't care about money. He cares about power. All he needed ADFA to do was to channel money to the big players financially. I got tickled when the reporters during the campaign came here. They were looking, trying to find out where Bill Clinton profited. He didn't. He profited by putting money into his friends' pockets. But imagine this. Imagine the power this man has in Washington, D.C. Imagine what he can do to this nation if he gets that circle of power going there, as he did here. Nothing I can do, nothing you can do can stop it. Because he'll have the absolute power, and believe me, he will use it to have you investigated, to have you arrested, to have uh, your company audited. Now, that's what will happen when his circle of power is complete. Although the documented information contained in the Clinton Chronicles continues to be reported in England and other countries, here in America, the media blackout continues. On July 14, 1994, copies of the Clinton Chronicles video were hand-delivered to every member of the United States Senate and House of Representatives. On July 25th, the documentation supporting the film was presented to Congress at their request. Whitewater hearings were scheduled to begin the next morning. However, the then House and Senate majority leaders, plotting with Robert Fisk to withhold evidence, refused to allow any of this documentation to be admitted. In addition, eyewitnesses willing to testify under oath who could confirm Clinton's involvement in the Arkansas drug smuggling money laundering operation were flown into Washington, but were barred from giving any testimony. Once again, the Constitution of the United States was undermined and the American people were not allowed access to the truth.